thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Dustin Bird. I am the uh, professor of philosophy and religion at Olivet College, and the founder and editor in chief of Ekprosis Press, as well as the founder and co director of the Institute for Critical Social Theory. And today I have with me Dr. Rudolph J. Siebert. I uh, was a professor emeritus from Western Michigan University in the Department of Comparative Religion. He also taught in the sociology department. He taught for over 50 years at WMU. He's the founder and director of two international courses, one in Dubrovnik, Croatia, and the other one in Yalta, Ukraine, in the Crimea. He's written dozens of books and hundreds of articles on critical theory of uh, religion, on the critical theory of the Frankfurt School, books on Hegel. Uh, political theology, psychology of religion. Uh, he has, for over 50 years, developed the critical theory of religion and society. He's recently published a book, Hegel and the Critical Theory of Religion, with Ekperosis Press. He's currently working on a new book on the authoritarian personality. He's also a member of the Institute for Critical Social Theory, which was just founded in 2021. So, good to have you here. Welcome, Dr. Siebert. Good morning. So today what we're going to be talking about is the Frankfurt School and the dialectics of religion. Um, and religion is one of those things that, that you know, for a lot of people in our society, in a modern society, either think is just completely passe or it has no use anymore. Uh, and a lot of those critiques that come about from uh, on religion even come from some of those who influenced the Frankfurt School. Uh, including uh, Feuerbach and Marx and whatnot. So if we look at this, you know, some of these most important influences on the Frankfurt School argued for some form of abstract uh, negation of religion and society. For instance, Feuerbach thought that God uh, was merely a, a human projection. Marx thought that the critique of religion was the beginning of his emancipatory project and that religion, especially bourgeois religion, was the opiate of the masses, uh, quietly reconciling the proletarian masses to the class conditions they found themselves in. Uh, Lenin likened religion to spiritual homebrew in which, quote, the slaves of capital drowned the image of man and their demand for a life more or less worthy of human beings, unquote. Freud famously called religion the universal obsessional neurosis and thought that religion was an epiphenomenon of the psyche uh, and therefore it belonged to the infancy of, of mankind. Nietzsche be believed that, that uh, an age of true religious faith was over, that the Western man had essentially killed God, uh, yet he didn't, that Western same Western man didn't have the courage to abandon the values and moral codes of Christianity. Nietzsche called for the transvaluation of all values that we inherited from the Judeo-Christian tradition, in many cases, even if we're still uh, secular. Yet, despite these powerful critiques of religion, the Frankfurt School, especially Theodore Adorno, Max Horkheimer, uh, Walter Benjamin, Leo Leuventhal, Eric Fromm, went uh, a different direction than most of their immediate predecessors. In their work, they called for a determinate negation, an Aufheben of religion, as opposed to an abstract negation. What is the essential difference between an abstract negation of religion and a determinate negation of religion? Well, <clears throat> both, of course, negation of religion. But in one case, the abstract religion negation would mean that religion as such is backward, regressive, has to be left behind. While determinate negation means that some things in religion may be progressive, may be rational, and has to be rescued. Not because of religion, but because of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment cannot do without some of the values which have been developed in religion. So therefore, the, uh, it's simply the dialectical approach. It's the Hegelian approach uh, to religion as Marx in general took over Hegel's notion dialectics, even not only as reality dialectics. The Kapital is about the notion 
of the capital, how it develops, how it returns to itself, and so on. So, uh, so therefore, they applied the same Hegelian dialectics also to religion. Uh, they said the an abstract negation um, is an irrational approach. So, therefore, they had this idea of uh, transcendence or translation of religion or transformation uh, for the enlightenment sake, not for the religious sake. So they were not so much concerned with the rescue of religion, but they were concerned very much more for the rescue of the enlightenment, which had uh, come, had been endangered. And enlightenment means the bourgeois enlightenment of Rousseau and Voltaire, it means also the Marxist Enlightenment, and it means the Freudian Enlightenment. So these are the three Enlightenment movements. And the dialectic of Enlightenment we want to talk about is really the contradiction between religion and modernity, the Enlightenment movement. There was something else in medieval times. There was a certain harmony between the two. There was a certain concept of reason, which was not hostile. So Thomas of Aquinas had that synthesis of faith and reason. And then in the Renaissance and later, it splits and it becomes deeper and deeper, the abyss between the sacred and the profane. With the uh, look forward, maybe, of a reunion again of the two. And that is what this determinate negation is about. It would be... Um, would lead to a re reunion of religion and, uh, and enlightenment in that sense that some of the values of religion would be rescued. Yeah, so why should religion be rescued in, in the modern world? You know, it, it, it seems you know, especially in the American context, when you look at who's voicing these these very public forms of religion, they're also very regressive. Um, you know, it's it's almost like they're trying to denegate that which has already been negated, turn the the clocks around and go backwards into a different time, a time even before the Enlightenment. And so, some of these people are very open and honest uh, in the public sphere about what they want in in the world eclipses modern conceptions of individual autonomy uh it eclipses modern reason uh and, and really deliver us back to some kind of almost like a medieval period you know that or at least a medieval mind frame why should religion be be determinately negated or parts of it be rescued in this modern period well the answer has been given in a certain sense by Habermas's last book about uh, about the philosophy of religion. So uh, it is to be rescued. Religious elements are to be rescued for the enlightenment's sake, because human reason without any transcendence whatsoever, and transcendence means for Habermas uh, liturgy. That means as long as there is still liturgy, in which the transcendence breaks into the faith community. There is some challenge still to modern reason, to modern autonomous reason. And otherwise, if a reason is left to itself without these elements, it would be endangered. So it is for the enlightenment's sake that this rescue operation has to happen according to Habermas, but also according to Habermas's uh, teacher, Adorno. Adorno um, said, uh, non credo, I do not believe. He did not, in, in the discussion with Eugen Kogan and Walter Dirks, I do not believe. Uh, why not? Because the Christian re revelation, or also the Jewish revelation, or also the Islamic revelation, are simply not sufficient. He waited for a more adequate revelation. There were ma ma too many contradictions in these revelations. So, therefore, the non credo. But it's not an abstract negation 
of religion, but religion remains in the picture. So um, Habermas was educated a Protestant and uh, Adorno was baptized a Catholic and then he was educated a, a Protestant and then he became a Marxist. So um, nevertheless, the main issue is that something would happen to the enlightenment reason if it would not um, somehow supersede also positively um, religion, religious values. You know, it also seems that religion throughout religious history, if we look at, you know, the good it can do, the bad it can do, it can be very emancipatory, very progressive, but it also can be very dominating and, and tyrannical and brutish. There seems to be a a inner tension or inner core or inner antagonism within the human phenomenon religion in and of itself and it was max horkheimer and his notes in who called that this dialectical tension he, he 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 characterized it as a tension between good religion and bad religion the emancipatory side of religion and the dominating side of religion uh, that, you know, it's another theorist, Ali Shariati from Iran, always said this, the history of religion is not religion versus anti-religion, it's religion versus religion, and not two different religions, but one religion with the antagonism within itself fighting against itself. Is this the, the, the positive side of religion, the progressive, the emancipatory, the liberational? Is that the side of, or the, the, the aspects of religion that the Frankfurt School tries to rescue in their determinate negation? Yeah, so... A good religion would be one which follows its own impulses, its own transcendence, its own ethics, and so on. Bad religion is a religion which becomes conform to the society, to the order of domination, to the slaveholder society, to the feudal society, to the capitalistic society. It supports it, it motivates people to obey and to have faith, to have trust in their leaders and so on, uh, to go into war, to have army chaplains who motivate them to march against atheistic Bolshevism and uh, so thousands of army chaplains. So um, it is the, we, we have in Buddhism, of course, we have the tendency against the caste system, but then the Buddhists have conformed to that caste system anyway. So we have the idea of uh, emancipation and so on in St. Paul and all this. We don't know any difference anymore between men and women, between Greeks and Jews and so on. And uh, there is this equality, there's this freedom, there's this fraternity and so on. But then as the church became more and more a hierarchical church, it allied itself with the Roman state, the Constantinian Christianity, and it um, allied itself then with the uh, feudal system and with the capitalistic system as well. So that is bad religion. Um, and good religion is one which follows its own um, values, even if it gets in opposition to the state or to the king or to the slaveholder or to the feudal law or to the capitalist. And then produces martyrs, of course, and martyrs are the seed of new Christians. So the whole martyrdom comes from that that religion is not conform, but uh, opposes the state. Yeah, I, and I, I think that you brought up Constantine and Constantine's, you know, trend turn there where Christianity becomes the not is the, goes from being the non-conformist prophetic uh, religious tradition in opposition to the reality of the Roman Empire, the hierarchy of the Roman Empire, the brutality of the Roman Empire, and then somehow becomes allied with the empire as it gets closer and closer to becoming the the religion of the empire in and of itself, which of course later happened in the fourth century with Emperor Theodosius. Um, that it betrays itself in some kind of way or betrays its essence in some kind of way and becomes the legitimating force of the, the dominating power. Uh, so in that case, it goes from being, I think, what, what Horkheimer would call the good religion, the emancipatory, 
to be in a religion that conforms to the state, conforms to the world as it is, and uses the world as it is for its own benefit. I mean, is that a, a betrayal of the prophetic nature of, of Christianity in this case? Well, it probably was not seen that way, except maybe by the monks. Um, so they see a, a problem that, for instance, the um, Christian community did not take any soldiers <clears throat> into itself up to Constantine, and uh, the Christian could not be, be a soldier and so on. And then suddenly we have that change where Augustine writes the seven-point just war theory, which then was um, valid for 1,500 years. The Bush administration still used, used it in the Iraq war. So um, that, and with the seven points then, uh, that meant that suddenly Christians who thought that war was always bad, suddenly thought that some wars could be good, could be just in order to rescue the Roman virgins from the barbarians uh, attacking Rome or so. And with that come the army chaplains and so on. And so the whole 1500 years of Constantinian Christianity, which we thought in the Second Vatican Council, so that it had come to its end, but it hasn't come to its end. We have here Christian nationalism in this country, which very much uh, uh, continues this type of Constantinian Christianity. There's the whole issue with Horkheimer that they think, we like Bonhoeffer too, that originally Jesus did not intend to develop a new religion. So the issue of the religionless Christianity and Bonhoeffer became a martyr for this religionless uh, um, uh, Christianity. So before he was uh, delivered to the concentration camp where he was uh, hanged in Southern Germany, he went to a Catholic church and he, a Baroque church with all the figures and, and so on. Um, and he in, uh, told his uh, Soviet colleague who was his co-prisoner, he said that this would all come to an end. So he thought more of a Christianity, which was not a religion, but which was a prophetic type of a teaching. And he lived it. He lived it to the point where he was nakedly hanged up in this uh, Bavarian concentration camp. So, um, yeah, that is the, the whole problem which we have today. And uh, so there is a lot of um, bad religion around, but there is also good religion. So Horkheimer would call the liberation theology or the Christian communities in Latin and Central America, that would be good religion. But they also have the martyrs. So in El Salvador, 70,000 members of the Christian, basic Christian communities died, and Romeo was assassinated. And interesting enough, Francis, then Pope Francis, canonized him. Uh, that meant that the church finally said Romeo was right, and not the Arena Party, the fascist party and the fascist government. So that his resistance against this government was the right thing to do. That is why he was canonized. But the Pope himself has, has his dark uh, moments where he was not strong enough to stand up against the fascist government in his country, did not support the liberation theologians sufficiently, and with one of them he reconciled. In Frankfurt and St. Georg, they celebrated a mass together, but another one died without this reconciliation. So there was is a tension even in the present uh, papacy. Yeah, I think, you know, when you're discussing Dietrich Bonhoeffer, that's a really good example of, of this tension between good religion and bad religion, as so much of the institutionalized church in Germany during the Third Reich, you know, allied themselves with it, with the Reich's Concordat and whatnot. And yet you had the confessing church and you had Bonhoeffer and you had those who remained in opposition to fascism from a Christian perspective, right. whereas so many other Christians fell in line with it. They, you know, If they didn't already have the same prejudices, they adopted, adopted the same prejudices. They looked to the fascists to to protect them from the evils of Bolshevism. And in, in many ways, they lost that, that negative essence of 
of Islam, the negativity or of Islam, but of Christianity, the negativity of Christianity, the the one does not conform to this world uh, aspect of Christianity in their attempt to, in this case, gain power. You see the same thing uh, recently in America, as you were saying with Christian nationalism, the idea that yes, this Trump guy is not really one of us. He, you know, <laughs> he completely embodies all the seven deadly sins all day long, every minute of his existence. And yet, you know, this is the kind of person we need to fight for us because it gives us power, it protects us, it forwards our self-interest. That to me seems to be what Horkheimer is really getting at with this bad religion yeah. um, that leaves behind the good aspects. And that that good aspects, those emancipatory, emancipatory aspects are what the Frankfurt School hopes to, as you said, translate into, into you know, post-metaphysical language. Right. Yeah, I mean, we have it in a classical form with us when you look at the uh, Fox News and you look at the Eternal Word uh, television network. They cooperate very closely to each other, uh, with, with each other. And uh, Raymond Arroyo is even an anchor man in both of them, contributor to both of the networks. And this is uh, extremely right wing and extremely authoritarian. And there are continually very good religious elements are uh, somehow used for these right wing propaganda attacks continually, day after day, night after night. And so, and uh, millions and millions of people listen to both of these stations. The Eternal Word is in 140 countries, uh, so that is a worldwide influence, much more powerful than we ever had it, I think, in the, in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we are right in the middle of it, and sometimes that what is closest to oneself is the most invisible for oneself. We are in the middle of it. That we are, that we are. My uh, forthcoming book on Trump has uh, a chapter on Trump and the gaslight gospel, <laughs> which, you know, is an attempt to throw some light on this phenomenon of seeing someone completely at odds with the, the essence of your basic religious tradition, and yet they become the champion of the tradition. And I, I tie it back to Constantine, which is um, in Constantinian Christianity. But, you know, we can already see, even before Constantine and that, that turn of the state, we can already see in, in some ways in Paul, in his letters to the Thessalonians, when he argues, you know, don't expect, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, but don't expect Jesus to come back anytime soon, because we have, one, the catacon, right, the restrainer who's restraining the chaos of the world right now, and, and you should actually pray for the catacon, you should pray for that restrainer, and of course, that restrainer at his time was most likely Caligula. <laughs> during the writing you know so here you know he's in paul is basically saying to them to in, in later on in, in the book of, of the second peter where he tells people to obey their masters you know even if they're cruel and harsh obey them god put them over you that's a i think that 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 in many ways goes very much against um that non-conformist prophetic nature of of jesus because he certainly didn't submit to the to the Sanhedrin or the Jewish authorities or the Roman Empire, right? He, he protested against them in many ways. Yeah. I mean, when we compare Spartacus and, and Jesus, uh, the Jesus movement is much more tricky than Spartacus. Spartacus made a direct attack on Roman power and was, was conquered and 10,000 slaves were crucified at the Via Appia and so on shortly before Jesus. While Jesus tries to transform the consciousness of the people, um, it is true that Paul sends the slave Onesimus back to his master, <clears throat> but he tells the master, he's your brother now, and uh, he is different now from the way you had him before. And if you had any losses, I'm glad to pay for the losses you had for the time he was with me, and so on. So, but it is a more subtle type often overcoming, and some people say that the uh, Christianity ruined the Roman Empire uh, in the end by undermining its slave system, by having the idea of equality and brotherhood. <clears throat> so 
but uh, the uh, connection was finally made. That means the church allied itself with the state which crucified their founder. That is a really paradoxical type of a thing. And that Constantine was a rather problematic type of a guy. He, from the very beginning, uh, in an authoritarian way, used Christianity as a means. He was a uh, uh, Zoroastrian, like his father, Maitras, a Maitras man, and replaced Maitras by Jesus on his flags and stormed Rome and was successful. But for instance, he let himself not be baptized uh, uh, up to the end of his life, because at that time there was no sacrament of confession or reconciliation. So, if you uh, you would lose if you would lose your baptismal grace, you could not replace it by by going to confession. So therefore, he waited because he knew he would kill a lot of people, and he killed his wife and his son because he thought they had something with each other. And then he was finally baptized, but he was baptized uh, by by Arius, uh, by Arius people. That means those people who did not believe in the divinity of Christ, but thought that Jesus was just a man like Mohammed. Uh, so uh, that uh, um, is, is very problematic that the Christian community made this connection. Nevertheless, in spite of all, of all these uh, question marks. Yeah, I mean, in returning back to, I think Judaism, um, because you know the entire first generation of Frankfurt School were all Jewish, and while they certainly talked a lot about Christianity, they they drew from the Jewish tradition, uh, and so much so that even, for instance, Leo Leuventhal calls the concept, the Jewish concept of the Bilderverbot, the image ban of the second and third commandment, um, he calls it the essentially the essence of critical theory, um, that this was, that the entire project of the Frankfurt School rests on this idea of thou shalt not make graven images, right? That thou shalt not uh, turn anything created into the creator or to make anything absolute or engage in apotheosis of anything. Um, do you see it that way? Do you think the the Bilderfebolt is the the foundation stone of of critical theory? Well, maybe I wouldn't go that far, but I think it was very important <coughs> for at least for Horkheimer and uh, Adorno and uh, Benjamin. <coughs> it was uh, the um, it was two two commandments. So the Bilderfebolt, uh, not to make images and also not to abuse the name. <laughs> but they of God. So, but there was a, a long tradition of that already. So, uh, some Jewish people would never use the name of God at all in order not to um, to abuse it. And of course, you know the whole issue with with images. So, uh, yeah, it was definitely uh, important in the whole struggle against idolatry. They, uh, they saw in our present civilization the idolatry of capital and other idolatries. So the image for both is the, um, is the law against making any finite element into the infinite, be it the leader or party or state or capital or whatever. So from this point of view, civil society is as it exists now, very idolatrous. Yeah, yeah, it always the, it always reminds me the builder for both of this perpetual negativity, um, you know, because they're not seeing it in a theological sense of you know, thou shalt not make any graven images of our God, our Jewish God. They translate it into political philosophy, you know, anti-capitalism, anti-nationalism, nationalism that, of course, makes the state or the, the leader into the great leader sent by God with absolute authority. And capitalism, of course, is the, the domination of the, the profit motive and money being the, the center of all things. And so, therefore, you know, they, they, for me, they translate it into a philosophical negativity that nothing in this world um, 
can rise to that kind of level because it creates these ideologies and these ideologies and any ideology can become a means by which masses of people are murdered, suppressed, oppressed. Um, and so it, to me, it it always seems that it, by holding on to the build of Fairbolt, it creates people who are perpetually nonconformist. They're always seeing the not pathologically always seeing the negativity and only the negativity because that's pathological but always seeing the limits of of the good and, and the bad and always willing to critique anything no sacred cow was left unslaughtered yeah i mean that is of course the enlightenment the whole enlightenment movement <clears throat> it has this negativity in itself but I mean, there is also something positive if you want to. So uh, Arkheimer put on his gravestone and that of his parents, uh, Psalm 91, in you eternal one alone I trust. This is really Jewish. I mean, that is the Psalms, you know. So um, in that sense, there's a real piece of a believer there. Uh, so particularly to put that on his gravestone. In you, eternal one, alone I trust. And we have to see, of course, that this uh, more positive turn to religion has something to do with the disappointment <clears throat> which the Frankfurt people went through because they believed with Marx, originally critical theory meant was a cover name for historical materialism. So they hoped that the workers would rise against Hitler and his power against fascism and against capitalism. You cannot talk about fascism without talking about capitalism or capitalism without fascism and so on. So, um, but the workers didn't do that. The workers, four million workers from all European states, which are the day NATO, marched with him against the Soviet Union where the revolution had taken place. So they went not the revolutionary way, they went the anti-revolutionary way. That was a massive disappointment. And it, I think it brought a certain distancing from Marxism after the Second World War. And part of that distancing may also have been that religious turn. And one has to see that Marx, of course, was not like the bourgeoisie, was simply an atheist. It may very well be that he was a, was a pantheist, uh, that means that he was in this Baruch Spinoza tradition. There were many revolutionary, young revolutionary men coming from Spinoza, and uh, I think that Marx may have been closer. I had a discussion with Walter Dirks about this, and he was convinced that uh, Marx was more of a pantheist than, than an atheist. So, therefore, there are reasons why <clears throat> Uh, the Frankfurt School was more open to religion than Marx may have been. And then also Marx was more on the side of Jesus teaching. He didn't take him as the son of God, but as a great teacher like Socrates. And, uh, and then he compared what Jesus had taught with the actual behavior of Christians in London or Christians in Berlin or in Brussels. And he saw that they did the exact opposite of what Jesus had taught and still did it in Jesus' name. So, uh, and uh, that they somehow uh, used uh, Christianity simply as a means of social control. Yeah, there's that interesting story in, um, you can find it in, I think it's Eric Fromm's book, uh, Marx's Concept of Man, and it coming from, Marx's daughter talking about how Marx would take them to church on Sundays to hear the music. And the daughter asked uh, Marx uh, who that person was up on that cross. And he gave the most profound but yet simple Christology. There once was a poor carpenter and the rich people murdered him. In yeah. The most simplest but yet profound Christology. Yeah, right. And the children of Marx said, and he settled it for us for life. So um, what he had told them was really convincing for them. Yeah. I mean, he saw a, a, a proletarian 
killed by an empire with a collaborating class you know what i mean for for being engaged in in, in many ways a critique and attack on the empire you know yeah. and the ruling class so i mean absolutely fascinating yeah. but there was a nice story of a man who was in uh, nicaragua and he had to go to a doctor in nicaragua uh, when nicaragua was socialistic or what it will become again or is already again and so the old doctor said, you know, this is a hospital, so and so. And uh, then he suddenly s s told him that this was named after Karl Marx. It was a wonderful hospital for the poor. Uh, the, the man thought, you know, it was by a saint. Uh, so the Christians had founded that hospital. No, it had the name of, uh, of Karl Marx because the... Uh, socialists in Nicaragua had built that. So in a certain sense, uh, Marxists took the place of, of Christians. And that is a reason, of course, for right-wing Christians to fight Marxism. As, for instance, uh, uh, Christian historians never want to accept that Spartacus died on the cross. They think Spartacus died in battle which is very important because otherwise Spartacus moves too close to Jesus. And um, so it is this competition, I think, which makes um, Fox News and also the Eternal Word so unbelievably hostile against Marx, Marx and whatever is Marxist, and they see Marx everywhere. <clears throat> so um, we see that the dialectic of religion and enlightenment is a very important issue, very much with us. Yeah, it's interesting living in a very, obviously, the center of global capitalism, that the the religious voices that are the most loud or present or in the public sphere are always ones that bring together Christ or Christianity in capitalism. And yet, you know, it, it, it's really... Um, at least from the perspective of Walter Benjamin, I want to read a little piece here. It, it's not so much that um, Christ and capitalism, but Christ and historical materialism, you know, the religion and histor historical materialism, that is the more natural alliance, if you will. So what I'm talking about is in, in Walter Benjamin's uh, thesis on the concept of history, he paints a picture of, of the automaton. And I'll read this quick little uh, blurb here that he that he writes in the thesis in the philosophy of history. He says, the story is told of an automaton constructed in such a way that it could play a winning game of chess, answering each move of an opponent with a counter move. A puppet in Turkish attire and with a hookah in his mouth sat before a chessboard placed on a large table. A system of mirrors created the illusion that this table was transparent from all sides. Actually, a little hunchback, who was an expert chess player, sat inside and guided the puppet's hand by means of strings. One can imagine a philosophical counterpart to this device. The puppet, the puppet called historical materialism, is to win all the time. It can easily be a match for anyone if it enlists the service of theology, which today, as we know, is wizened and has kept out of sight. Um, you know, he's so therefore, I mean, he's suggesting that that it's historical materialism, Marxism, uh, if it's to win in the perpetual history of class uh, struggle, for instance, it must enlist the services of theology, enlist the services of, of religion. Um, but yet theology, at least at the time of writing, uh, of Benjamin's writing, as he says, is the ugly hunchback that has to stay out of sight. It has to hide in the machine behind the historical materialist. Now, what, what does Walter Benjamin mean by this? Is it the idea that historical materialism can't fulfill its, its project unless it still has some kind of theological core or something like this? Well, first of all, when you look behind my head, you'll see that uh, picture of the first thesis of the automaton in the back there, because it is the cover of one of my books, and I have it behind me hanging there. So there's the picture of it. <clears throat> so, I mean, but that, I think it shows very well what the attitude uh, of the uh, Frankfurt School was <clears throat> toward religion and toward Marxism. Of course, in the meantime, 
you know, Marxism has also become an ugly little dwarf like theology, so they are both in bad shape <laughs> in a certain sense at, at the moment. <laughs> but uh, the, the idea was that historical materialism needed religion. So it needed, maybe not really, but it needed theology. And, uh, but theology also needed historical materialism. It is true the other way around. So um, theology, in order to become active in the real historical process, needs historical materialism. And historical materialism needs this deeper grounding in theology. So that is behind that um, determinant negation issue of religion. That is the way how, how it is done positively. So the picture shows very well how the, um, uh, how the Frankfurt School wanted to supersede the abyss between the religious and the secular. Yeah, I think it was Zizek who suggested that uh, in, in Benjamin's time, that the the theology, the ugly theology, had to remain hidden behind historical materialism. He said, but today, <laughs> with the way the world is today, especially in the West, you know, it, it's the other way around that somehow historical materialism has to be the the dwarf hiding within religion, uh, yeah. getting that uh, that project done. Well, but the we have to see that we are, of course, in the counter revolutionary period. So both religion in so far as it is revolutionary and historical materialism are both ugly dwarfs at this moment, but this is this moment. And the question is how long the counter-revolutionary period lasts. And they always think, the counter-revolutionaries think that their counter-revolution is always the last word of history. But then we see a few minutes later that this is not the case. <clears throat> so the, the socialism, of course, is spreading not only in China and Korea and in, in, uh, in Venezuela and in uh, Cuba and, and so on. Uh, we just don't like to pay attention to it, but it is still very much the theme. And um, sooner or later it will change. Because it will change because the fundamental issue which we never talk about is that the problem remains. It is not Marx, Marx, Marx. It is the contradiction in capitalism, which is the problem, not Marx. Marx only made it known. We shoot at the messenger. Uh, we should address the problem. The problem is the contradiction in capitalism between the private appropriation of surplus labor and the collective appropriation of collective surplus labor. That is the contradiction. And before that the contradiction is not resolved, any counter-revolution will only be temporal and it will come up again and again until it will be resolved. That means that those who produce the surplus value, the value beyond their wage or the, beyond their salary, will also appropriate it, and not that a small group of non-workers appropriates what 150 million workers have produced. That is the problem, not Marx is the problem, or, or whatever, uh, Malthus, or whatever. They were, Marx was not the only one who saw the contradiction. He was not the only one who suggested what, how this contradiction could be overcome. Only the way he thought it should be a worldwide uh, labor revolution, that did not happen in the 20th century. And that was the great disappointment to which the Frankfurt School people had to adjust. And part of their adjustment was their religious position. Yeah, and it's, it's pretty clear, you know, from Marx's earliest writing, um, I think he wrote even in his Abitur about the, the divine spark of, of humanity that somehow gets smoldered, it gets it's wiped out, it's snuffed out by, by the society, in this case, the, the capitalist society. 
which is a legitimate religious critique of capitalism that somehow was translated in his life into what later we would call historical materialism, but it was already there in religious form. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, Marx and his father, you know, they were Kantians, first of all, and then he became Hegelian, and then he became a Marxist uh, himself. So, um, yeah, that, uh, and that happened then with the Frankfurt School too. So it is not, cannot be called Marxist as such. It could also be called Nietzschean as well. Uh, Nietzsche, who was the last bourgeois enlightener. Uh, so, and, and Adorno was very much uh, um, taken by him. Or a Schopenhauerian. They, uh, Mark, uh, Horkheimer and Adorno were definitely Schopenhauerians. So was Freud. But so was also Hitler and Goebbels. And here we have to uh, revise, you know, all the propaganda which we had about fascism. Fascism is not a little man with a little beard or whatever, or Hitler or Mussolini or whatever. It is quite a, a tough type of a worldview which is able to fascinate millions and millions of people of authoritarian personalities who despair about what democracy can do. They despair about what parliaments can do, that they cannot solve the problems, the uh, pandemic or, or the ecological problem or all the problems which come up. Uh, the democracy seem to be too slow and people become impatient and therefore they turn into, uh, into uh, authoritarian type of personalities. The leader then is supposed to be the one who solves the problem solver as from Corson. So, and they hold on to him, no matter how bad he may be or whatever personal sins he commits, or as Tom said, I go to Manhattan and kill somebody and they will still follow me. You could not have a better definition of authoritarianism and fascism than that. Fascism is a very, very serious type of a thing because it rejects the religious idea that simply to be natural for us, simply to be chimpanzees is not good enough. Fascism says you can be a chimpanzee. We are chimpanzees. It is the uh, issue of the aristocratic principle of nature, the power over right, the, the, the mo most powerful race, most powerful nation, that is what it's all about. So, um, and we are in the situation now that we have two, the Slavic world and the American world in had Europe, and therefore we have this antagonism between the two, which has to be resolved peacefully Otherwise, we will blow ourselves up. And uh, that is our real problem. But there also, again, the democracies are too slow and therefore are taken over by oligarchies, which determine without even people knowing what in God's name they are doing. So, um, so that is our, our present situation. So the, the uh, Frankfurt School is full of actuality in that it has sealed in from the very beginning on the authoritarian personality, on this threat for democracy, which was really a wonderful accomplishment. Our constitution is a wonderful document. It has to be renewed now in a new world situation, but um, that would, at the moment, that would not be the right moment to do it. But at some point it will have to be reformulated. But at the time, and for a long time, it was a great, wonderful document. So, and uh, there is included the idea, of course, of, uh, we, we did not add the idea of democracy to the constitution that is also French inheritance already. The French Revolution had strong democratic elements, which were overcome by Napoleon then. But Napoleon was celebrated by Beethoven in the Ninth Symphony and so on. So then we have already this issue 
that one celebrates authoritarian people because they get things done. That is the issue. So therefore, we have to see that we develop a democracy which can get things done, which can also defend itself, which is strong enough to defend itself. Yeah, that's so, the basic thesis in Plato's uh, Republic in how democracy, you know, those who are put in charge aren't don't have the capacity to address the needs and the problems and the situations. You know, they don't know what they're doing and, and people get frustrated and before long they're clamoring for the tyrant who will, like you right. said, with efficiency, fix all these problems. But nevertheless, they're still a tyrant. Yeah, and, and he promises and he doesn't keep his promises. Yeah, and that's the in the Machiavellian moment, right? right. To make the promises, but don't pretend to, to keep them. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I have one last question. If we tie us back to the uh, the second generation of critical theorists, uh, in terms of Jürgen Habermas, who in the last few decades has written a lot about religion, he's probably one of the most still today most influential philosophical voices who's open to religion and religious people. Uh, as opposed to shutting it down as, you know, following Marx or, or Freud and say that it's just passe and it needs to go, belongs to the infancy. And yet here's Habermas, second generation of the Frankfurt School, still open to religion. Um, and he believes that that if religion is to enter into the post-secular public sphere, where its semantic and semiotic material can contribute to the democratic will formation, can contribute to the um, the discussions about how a country, how a people uh, should be run, how legislation should be crafted and what's in the legislation. Uh, he believes that such religious material has to be translated from what he calls the closed semantic universe. Him and Rawls have that same language that has to be translated from the closed semantic universe of religion into post-metaphysical reasoning. So reasoning unencumbered by the uh, the semantics, if you will, or the the worldview of the religion in and of itself is that is that possible to translate that kind of material into uh, secular political language, post metaphysical language? Um, well, yes, I, I think so. I I visited uh, Habermas in Frankfurt several times, and I participated in seminars with him and Apple, with whom he cooperated a lot. Uh, so. Can that be done? It has been done. When you think of egalité, liberté, fraternité, where, where does that come from? These were Catholic Frenchmen who turned into enlighteners. And uh, already from Galileo on, they were all pious Catholics who suddenly became more and more enlightened. And their church did not accept the enlightenment and could not under the church could not see themselves any longer in those enlightened believers. So Galileo was a believer, and at the same time, he was a scientist and so on. So the Habermas, of course, uh, you know, as a, even a pastor, I think, in his family story, but of course, he was in the Hitler Youth, too, and, um, and other things. And then he was fascinated when he suddenly, after the war, they came in contact with Horkheimer and Adorno, and he was not in good terms with Horkheimer, but he was in very good terms with Adorno. And um, so from, it was the religious thing was not there in the, in the beginning, but in the recent decades, he became, and he is the most outstanding philosopher of our time. Um, he became more and more interested in religion uh, exactly by uh, studying autonomous religion, uh, autonomous reason. There's some misunderstanding which Catholics always have. They think Thomas Aquinas made that synthesis between faith and reason. So we have settled it and we hold on to Thomas Aquinas and then we have settled it. But the reason which Thomas Aquinas had was another reason than people developed after the Renaissance and so on, and, and particularly after the uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, revolution of the 17th century and so on. So what is the difference? The difference is that it is autonomous. That means it is no longer under control of faith. It is no longer under control of the church or of the hierarchy, 
hierarchy of the Holy Inquisition. It has rebelled against them. It had to rebel against them because it was strangled in, by the Inquisition in that close thematic uh, uh, dimension. <laughs> and it had to break out of this in order to uh, move the human species further. So that is the conflict. And uh, so it is, uh, <clears throat> people see that, or Habermas sees that there is of course the danger that this autonomous reason becomes so autonomous that it makes itself absolute. And when it makes itself absolute, it becomes perverse. In order to prevent this perversion, it has to open itself up to the challenge, which is still left in religion. And what is that challenge? Wherever there is a Christian community, which is still practicing its faith in liturgical forms, that means in language, and uh, allows the transcendence to break into the immanence in that language. That means as long as they do this, as long as they celebrate the mass still in one form or the other, Protestant or Catholic or whatever, um, so long there is still a challenge. It has to be challenged, uh, this autonomous reason, that it does not absolutize itself because when it absolutizes itself, it will become perverse. So it is this concern, as we said from the very beginning, not so much for religion, it is the concern for the enlightened world, which has to remain, there has to be um, uh, strong enough to keep that principle of, it is called the principle of internality, or the principle of subjective freedom or free subjectivity, which broke out in the city states and it broke out again in the reformation. And when this principle of free subjectivity breaks in, it produces a lot of chaos, which we see around us too. It seems to be arbitrary very often and um, but it is unavoidable that uh, Plato tried to deal with that by taking an enlightenment, namely Socrates, and uh, making him into a new type of man, an enlightener who is also aware of the negativity of the enlightenment and negates it. That was Socrates. And uh, something similar, of course, has to be done. But what, what really happens is when this principle of internality or free subjectivity or so breaks through, it uh, somehow weakens the objective ideas like family and civil society and state, all that becomes uh, unimportant in a certain way. And all what counts is my own well-being and all this. So, and uh, so that somehow the idea of property and contract and personal well-being becomes all what people are interested in and nobody's interested anymore about what the state does or what people, what states do in history and whatever. So nevertheless, the, uh, the, it is not enough to come with Thomas Aquinas or whatever. It would be better to come with Hegel because he was aware from the very beginning with the dialectic of enlightenment and, uh, and was uh, somehow tried to overcome the dialectic of enlightenment. That means he was an enlightener who was at the same time critical of the enlightenment. And that is exactly what we need. We have to preserve or develop further the enlightenment and we, we have, to be, have to struggle with the dialectic of enlightenment that the enlightenment turns against itself. And that means that it absolutizes itself and dies in the process and falls to authoritarianism, a reason which uh, capitulates has to surrender to the leader. Yeah, it seems like, you know, there's this long history of this debate about reason and faith, you know, even if we start with Augustine, who says, you know, reason has to be tempered by faith you know it seems to be some kind of tacit understanding of the potentials for reason to 
a gauge of apotheosis, you know, and then you get to, like you were talking about with well, Aquinas, and then reason becomes ancillary to faith. It becomes its tool to prove the faith condition or the, the faith position. Um, and you get Kant, you know, where, where he denotes the limitations of reason. Reason can do this, but it, its borders are here, and after that comes faith. And then, as you said, with Hegel, who brings the two together into faith and reason in some kind of way, but also in such a way that reason cannot become pathological because right. it critiques right. itself. Yeah. And it constantly is reminded of itself and, 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 and thinks about itself and engages in some kind of determinate negation of itself. Right. Um, and, and you're right. So, you know, before him was Luther, who said, of course, famously, reason is a whore, you know. <laughs> so... Yeah. And that was the, of course, the, 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 our last video where we talked about um, Pope Benedict XVI, part of his critique was the, the problem of dehellenization. When you take reason out of faith, what happens to faith? Faith itself becomes pathological, becomes, you know, uh, completely irrational in that sense. So, so yeah, and, you know, getting back to, to Habermas, um, what always struck me as is, is, probably his best example of how particular semantic and semiotic material from religion can be translated into uh, post-metaphysical reasoning and contribute to how humanity governs itself is the the move from the religious idea of the imago dei or the image of god that all all humans are created in the image of god and therefore are, are are worthy of moral and ethical concern and equality and, and they're inherently fraternal uh, and that gets somehow translated into human rights that all humans by virtue of being human have are, are the bearers of human rights and that's not something any anyone can take away from anybody and that's you know one of the arguments for the framers of the constitution which we talked about it's one of the reasons why they said that our our uh our rights came from god if that was the case, which it's questionable whether they even thought that, but they put it that way. If by putting it that way, they made it so one cannot take them away. So if one great man in the medieval period was Anselm of Canterbury, who thought that we should try to know what we believe. And that somehow would have to be done because to talk in terms of the image of God what if you don't know God, though, who then is the image? What is the image? When you don't know the original, how can you know the image? Or does the image tell us something about the original and so on? So the question is not only to rescue some faith elements, but also to learn to know what was a matter of faith. That is what reason, this autonomous reason, would have to do. It would not simply negate it and say it's all nonsense, but it would say it was believed, but can we see uh, the truth of that what was believed? Can we get enough evidence of that? So, and somehow when he refers, he does refer to the image of God, that is a tricky type of a thing when you say we have the image but we cannot know anything about god and the enlightenment of course had this doctrine god cannot be known enlightenment was agnostic the uh, deism which is an invention of the enlightenment Rousseau and voltaire invented it because Catholicism was a bad religion in the sense that it had supported the, the kings and uh, of God's grace and so on and so on. So therefore the revolution to decapitate them, one could not do that in the name of the religion which had legitimated them and therefore Catholicism had to be replaced by deism. But deism uh, simply said that God had created the world and then he left it to itself. That means left it to the bourgeoisie, those who won the revolution. And they could then do whatever they wanted to without any knowing who God was and what he wanted. So therefore, when we look at this, um, why religion is so important for Habermas, 
is to prevent the autonomous reason to become absolute and also to be able to see the truth in that what was once believed. So it is a change in form, not in content. The religious content would have to be removed from the form of faith into the form of knowledge. Can that be done without falling into the tricks of, uh, of Gnosticism? That is, of course, a question. So <clears throat> there are problems involved, but this is the way in which one would proceed. Yeah, and it's one of the things that he's talked about in his last books as well is the how philosophy constantly returns to religion because in many ways, especially modern philosophy rooted in autonomous reason, oftentimes exhausts itself and okay. returns to religion, not for some kind of inspiration, but literally for material, right? How, how do we think about these things that have throughout the course of human existence been expressed in religious ways now can we be returned to them, not to simply borrow, you know, and to resurrect, you know, some kind of anachronistic way, resurrect some kind of real archaic religious beliefs, but how can religion, how can faith, how can theology still inform someone who is of the Enlightenment? Yeah. So, I mean, the labor, labor movement transformed the love of your neighbor into solidarity. Mm -hmm. And solidarity um, represents in a, uh, you know, in an open way, broken out of the semantic dimension of religion and is worldwide used as in terms of, you know, in socialist countries, particularly. So, yeah, so one can obviously do this translation without uh, losing substance. One can transform the religious substance into into knowledge and into action, into solidary action. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Siebert, we've reached our, our time and it's been wonderful talking to you about this uh, very interesting subject matter. So if our viewers are interested in reading more, um, feel free to look at Dr. Rudolf Siebert's uh, website. He's got decades and decades and decades worth of writing on the subject matter. Uh, and I've I've personally learned so much uh, from him over the course of the last 30 years. I have my own book, uh, The Frankfurt School and the Dialectics of Religion, is also available. Um, Amazon or through the website, the Ekperosis Press website as well. Uh, and this book was highly influenced by all the great conversations I've had with Dr. Rudolph J. Siebert. So. Thank and you. to have this wonderful publishing house, which has this name back to the roots. Yes. Back to the roots. Yes, yeah. that's what we have done today. Exactly, exactly. So thank you again for doing this. It was wonderful. You're welcome. Absolutely. Have a good day. Same to you. Mm -hmm.